afternoon. Welcome to my little studio in Weymouth. My name is Sylvia Berry. It's a rainy day here in New England. So that's sad, but it ends up being a good thing because were it a nice day, I would have to run out and tell all my neighbors to turn off their leaf blowers and lawn mowers and all the other yard equipment that makes lots of noise on a sunny day. Thank you so much for joining me here. As this is my first time doing this, you have to excuse me as I panic and come around behind the camera just to make sure it's working. Excuse me for a second. I think it's working. So again, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, this is one of four instruments that are in the room. I'm going to try and be heroic and play all four of these instruments for you. I'm a specialist in historical keyboard instruments, and by that I mean instruments that predate the piano. The piano as you know it, which didn't really come onto the scene until around 1870. So think of every composer before that. That's Bach, Beethoven, Schubert, even Chopin played a different kind of keyboard instrument than the one that you are used to seeing. So uh, my sweet and kind husband, Dale Munchie, who is going to be my cameraman, but again, I heroically said, I can do it myself. <laughs> he tuned up the instruments this morning. I'd like to thank him. He also rigged a very impressive looking system where the phone is clamped to a ladder, which is on casters, so I can wheel it around. So this is high tech here. So this instrument is called a virginal. It's actually a type of harpsichord. I'll explain a little later what a harpsichord is. Oh, by the way, shout out, St. Andrews, Hilary Greer, Denise Fredrickson, thank you so much for having me and teaching me how to do this. So this instrument is a virginal and it's a type of harpsichord instrument, as I just said. So you may have seen a thing like this in paintings by Vermeer and other Dutch artists. And this is fun. It's not every day that you get to hear a virginal. And in one of my normal concerts, I wouldn't be able to bring all four instruments from my collection. So this is why I want to try and give you a taste of that. So before explaining what a harpsichord is, I'll just play this thing for you. The virginal, we don't know why it's called a virginal. If that's popping up in the questions, we don't know. So, this is a piece by Jan Peterson Svelink, a Dutch composer. Uh, we now think maybe he didn't write it, but for today's sake, let's just say he wrote this thing. It's called Malle Simon, which means Silly Simon. And Svelink lived between 1562 and 1621, so this is very early music. Not as early as medieval renaissance, those people I know what you think, but it's early for the scope of what we're doing here today. So I hope you enjoy this little piece.
sounds like a big lute. And all the harpsichords have that quality because something is plucking the string when I depress the key. I'd like to play a short bit of a piece called Roland by William Byrd. This is a composer from the same era, 1500s to early 1600s, just so you can hear a more strumming quality. So this is the first, uh, just the theme from Roland, which is a piece that comes from the Fitzwilliam Virginal book, of which there are two volumes. Historical instruments also. So 
this is really a joy to have this. I'm very lucky to have this instrument. And one of the things I played on that graduate recital, on another instrument of his, was a suite by a 17th century French composer named Louis Couperin. And I love this music. It's 17th century soul music. It's just so beautiful. It's a little strange in that the prelude is unmeasured. I'm going to try and show you the music. It's just a series of whole notes with slurs and lines. And out of that comes some music. So it's an unmeasured prelude. There are no note values written. And yet, if you start to read the notation, you see patterns, you see chords, you see scales. And at first you can say, oh, this is very troubling, this no notation, because how do I know how to do it? And later you say, I love that there are no note values here, because now I can sort of do what I want. That's nice. And the French composers were really the ones who, you know, uh, sort of gave us harpsichord style. It was based on the lutenists of the day. And French harpsichord music is just something you should learn if you want to learn how to play the harpsichord. So I'm going to play a few movements of this, not the whole piece. I'm going to play that funny unmeasured prelude. Um, this will be far out for a lot of people, I think. But try to imagine it as a recitation. Imagine that this is an order giving a presentation, and maybe they're even extemporizing a bit. And so if you think of it that way, you won't be a bit puzzled by the fact that there's no meter. It should, if I do it correctly, have moments of rest and moments of uh, passion, and you should hear all those things, hopefully. And then I'll play two pieces that feature the two manuals played sort of on top of each other. It's called a pièce croisée. It means a crossed piece. And that's a really stunning effect. You'll hear the difference uh, in sound. And then I might take a stab at this big kasakaya at the end. I should show you very briefly, for those of you who don't know what a harpsichord is. And this isn't what a harpsichord is, it's just a bit. <laughs> what the sounds are. Oops. And they'll play at the same time. If I want even more sound, the four foot register sounds, and I have an octave above that. So that's. And there's a buff stop. I don't know if that will appear today. But please enjoy some Louis Cooper. That's a new composer to you that's fun for me. Oh, this is a sweet and C major, by the way, parts of.
Courant and Sarah. In 17th century French music, be it opera or a keyboard suite, there's quite often a big pasakaya at the end. And they're great. Uh, it's a recurring, near recurring bass line, and then you hear variations over it. One of the reasons French music is so yummy from this period on to WC is chords like this. So, I might leave out some good plays. I might. I have my clocks to make sure I get everything in on time. So, for my purest friends, if there's a good play that was your favorite and I didn't do it, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, th this, will, this will be a version. We'll see how much I, I feel like doing.
with that. Normally, actually, I should end with a fun minuet, but I think that was where I wanted to end, so that's where we're ending for now. I wanted to play some Bach also. I'm looking at the time a bit, making sure I can do that. So Johann Sebastian Bach is a composer you all know. No more new music. And oh, and yes, Oberlin. Because Reverend Hilary Greer, who asked me to do this, is an Oberlin grad. I went to the conservatory, got tendinitis, and other things. I, I met a lot of great friends, and I, I really did have some good times there. But I left NEC to go to Oberlin to get over my tendinitis, which Peter Tarkash helped me do. Thank you very much. And then that is where I got interested in these historical instruments, although I have to say my parents had a very extensive collection of period instrument recordings that were sort of in the ether, as well as the jazz and the rock and roll, classical, all these things. And so I had heard the harpsichord. And it was really wonderful at Oberlin to get the chance to play all these instruments. There's a really extensive collection, the virginals, harpsichords, forte pianos. Now that I've left, there are, I mean, after I left, there appeared things like a pedal clavichord, really fancy, nice stuff. I think there's a chromatic harpsichord. Anyway, any plethora of instruments. And actually that Louis Cupram, Pasakai. I remember that during Baroque Performance Institute, which is a summer course they have, this friend Michael Sponsor, who I mentioned, I didn't know him then, but I just peeked my head in the door during one of these concerts, and I knew he played the harpsichord. There was this one kid, you know, because we were children then, um, who played the harpsichord. We had theory class together. I didn't know him, and so, wow, there's a harpsichord major here as an undergrad. That's amazing. And I heard him play that thing, and I didn't know what it was. I thought, that is amazing. And I think it actually took me a while to learn what it was I had heard that night. And it's a funny thing, all these, oh, it's a couple of decades and change later that, uh, you know, I still play this piece, and I love it. And this is some Johann Sebastian Bach. As I said, no introduction necessary. So these are movements from an English suite that I prepared for a concert that got canceled, concert cancellations in the time of Corona. Uh, my first one to go was a concert I was supposed to do during Lent. Uh, Emmanuel Music here in Boston uh, has a Bach cantata every Sunday, but also during Lent, there's always a, a six week series of concerts of, you know, they pick a theme every year. This year's theme was the English suites of Johann Sebastian Bach. Michael Beatty curates that. And I learned suite number one in A major and then didn't do it because we all finally figured out we should stay at home. So I'm going to play some of this. Uh, I'm ending up playing a lot of harpsichord, which will be funny for people who primarily know me as a pianist and a forte pianist. But as many of us are learning new technologies and delving into things we don't always have time for. Now that all of my concerts up until October uh, are canceled slash postponed, I had all this time to play the harpsichord that I don't normally have. And it's really great because it's sort of one of my secondary instruments. And you know, when it's the thing you don't do every day, it's actually a lot of fun in a, in a way that's hard to explain. So I've just been having such a good time. So I'd like to play some movements of this. It's a it's a long suite. Um, maybe I'll tell you what the movements are as I go. Yeah. So this is at least the prelude from the suite in A major by Bach, and probably some other things. Keeping watch on the time. I hope you all are enjoying. This is a bizarre way to give a concert, but really wonderful. And yeah, thank you all for tuning in. I don't know how many of you there are. But uh, it's nice to be with you in this way.
out for a second. I'm very sorry. I'm going to start over.
timed poorly, I have to swivel the ladder around again. Hold on. St. Andrews in Yardley, PA. I hope you have me again so that I can play more piano music. Oops. Here we go. Oh, I'm starting to see the faces which I hadn't seen before. That's really distracting. Now I feel like DJ D Nice. I want to start calling out all the people. And Amir Questlove Thompson. I'm watching you too, Amir. Thank you for the uh, lecture about sampling the other night. That was great. Okay, here I am. This is the type of piano that Haydn, Mozart, and Beethoven at the beginning of his career played. This is it. This is the only type of piano Mozart ever saw. The one on the other side of the room, which I'm determined to still play for you somehow, is a kind that Haydn saw when he finally uh, traveled outside of the little area he lived in, uh, which was Vienna and also this palace in Esterhaze. So that, that behind us is something I want you to see. So, uh, so yeah, so I'd like to play some Mozart on this piano. I'm going to play some of the variations on Avu Dira Je Maman, which is for us, Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, or the ABC song, and that's fun on this piano. But again, I'm going to have to cut some movements. Uh, thank you so much. So this, oh, I never explained to you something. Hold on. A brief detour. So this thing. I just took the harpsichord apart. <laughs> if you look at this, you see a thing that looks a little bit like a popsicle stick. You see a thing sticking through it. That little plectra there, there's a little thing there. Let me not break it in front of my husband on Facebook Live. So that is like a little tiny guitar pick and here's the string and boop, it comes up and plucks the string. When you let the key go, this red thing damps the string. So that's what's happening on every harpsichord you see. On this piano and on any piano, when you depress a key, a hammer boop, comes up and hits the string. In two seconds, that's the difference between a harpsichord and a forte piano. That was your PBS learning moment. Really fast. Okay. This piano, as you'll see, has no pedals. So that's unusual. But it has knee levers, and so the things you're used to doing on a normal piano, you can still do. You, if you watch this thing, it's moving. You can't see the levers, but... started their keyboard careers as harpsichordists. Uh, and the, this kind of piano reached its heyday in the 1770s, and Beethoven was born in 1770. So by the time he came on the scene, this was the piano of the day. But then it underwent many transformations during his career. And so everything before Waldstein, though, is on this instrument, every violin solo before Opus 96 is on this instrument. And then back to Mozart, all of his keyboard works, the mature ones, were written for this instrument. Now this is a piece from the 1770s, so it would have worked on both, and I've played it on both. And I guess I still need my reading glasses. I haven't accepted that yet. Here we go.
Yeah. The trucks. <laughs> Here's the Broadwood. I'm sorry I didn't play Warvini's piano. Yes, Alistair, I have to. Yes, wait. Terrible. Alistair, thank you for mentioning the moderator. I forgot to tell you about this magic trick. Maybe you all thought the sound just went bad on your computer for a second. That's not what happened. I put the moderator on. So Viennese pianos have a thing which is stunning, which no other piano ever had, which is too bad. It slips a piece of cloth between the hammers and the strings, and that's how you make this. that have dual moderators, like two pieces of cloth. So they were very invested in Vienna in soft playing, as well as explosive loud playing. Now the stuff I should really be playing on this Broadwood here is Clementi and late Haydn. I'm gonna play some early Haydn. Or I could play some JC Bach. Uh, I'm not sure what to do. So anyway, my husband, Dale Munchie, it's, uh, so it's, uh, it's Holy Week, Easter's coming, resurrection. My husband resurrected this piano from the dead, seriously. It didn't play, it was in pieces. And my husband restored it. It was built in 1806 in London. It lived for a long time in my hometown of Philadelphia, 215 represent. Uh, and so it's very funny because it was at the Curtis Institute of Music and I walked past that place hundreds, thousands of times, I don't know. And before I even met Dale, he found this instrument and that's a funny story. Um, and he told me he had this unrestored Broadwood when I met him and I said, oh, we should stay in touch because I always wanted to play late hiding on one of these instruments. I, uh, we did stay in touch. I didn't think I would marry him, but I did. It's great. Hi, sweetie. <laughs> Thank you for everything, everything. So, uh, I eventually did make a recording of late Haydn sonatas on this instrument, and that's because Haydn traveled to London late in his career, first in 1791 and again in 1794, and played pianos like this, and they're very different from that. Now you see the pedals. This one has a cool split damper. I can undamp that, leave that dry, or do the opposite. I can make it softer. If I want to use the whole piano undamped, I have to depress two pedals at once. And you need a wide shoot for that. And these red patent leathers are my wide shoot. So quickly, here's some early Haydn. This is probably most assuredly a harpsichord piece, but we're gonna play some of it on the piano. Uh, thank you for being here. <laughs> Sorry for my poor time management, but okay, enjoy. Oh, let me tell you. <laughs>
that's okay for everyone. I really would like to do it again. I want to thank St. Andrew's Yardley in Pennsylvania, just about 45 minutes north of Philadelphia. So all my Philadelphians, please send me some tasty cakes and pretzels because they don't have that up here in Boston. Uh, but be safe, everybody. Please stay home when you can. Please take care of each other. It's a time for kindness and patience because it is it's very difficult, but we're so lucky that somehow we can still be together and share music together. And I'm just really honored and happy that I had this opportunity today. And so thank you all so much and uh, have a great rest of your day. Thank you.